Welcome to Skip the Queue, a podcast for people working in or working with visitor attractions. I'm your host, Kelly Molson. Each episode, I speak with industry experts from the attractions world. These chats are fun, informative, and hopefully always interesting. If you like what you hear, you can subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, and all the usual channels by searching Skip the Queue. In today's episode, I speak with Lee Cockrell, former Executive Vice President of Operations for the Walt Disney World Resort. We discuss day-to-day challenges running a large operation, the legendary Disney customer service, and Lee's biggest piece of advice to anyone operating a visitor attraction right now. So Lee, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. I have to say it is an absolute pleasure to have you on and I'm, I was I was so genuinely happy when you said that you'd come on and speak to us today. So thank you. Um, Yeah, happy to. We're missing all the UK people here in Florida. Oh, I know. We're really missing traveling as well. That's um, everyone that I'm speaking to is really missing going to all the amazing places that we're that we're not able to go to at the moment. So it's such a shame. It must be strange there. It must be really quiet for you in Florida. It is. We don't even have much traffic, which is amazing. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, very strange times. That's maybe not a bad thing. Less traffic, though. Less traffic, better weather, (laughs) apparently. But but there's no place to go. So that's the bigger problem. (laughs) (laughs) No. Well, look, I mean, we I normally start off. We we haven't spoken before. And um, I normally like to find out a few things about you, personal things up, up front. So I wondered if you'd mind asking answering a few icebreaker questions for me. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Okay. No problem. So, Lee, do you prefer cats or dogs? Well, I had a dog the whole time I was growing up from first grade until I left home and I loved that dog more than anything. Oh. So I guess I would, we had a cat once too, but it, it was not as friendly as the dog. So I would have to go with dog. <laughs> okay. It's a good answer. That means that we, we can definitely be friends because I'm a dog person. Too. <laughs> I've got, I've got one of them sitting down here on the floor next to me as we speak. Um, what's your hobby what's your favorite hobby uh you know my hobby i i quit playing golf because i was so bad at it (laughs) and i gave my golf clubs to my son because nobody claps when i play golf so public (laughs) speaking is kind of really my uh my hobby because people clap and i'm very insecure person so i need that kind of uh feedback from people oh i love that i love that's very honestly thank you Um, okay, and so tell me something. You're you're you are very good at many things, but tell me one thing that you're not very good at apart from golf. You know, I was in business for 42 years, and I hate the finance department. So <laughs> uh, I always had to have a good finance person around me because I, somehow the numbers bored me, and uh, I never worked very hard to understand them. So I had somebody explain them to me every month. Lee, you sound so much like me. <laughs> I think there's I think there's a lot of business people that do not like the numbers and just they just need someone to take take over that side of things okay exactly listen I would love to just hear a little bit about your background and how you came to be the VP of Disney World how did that come about I guess it was magic it's a miracle actually (laughs) I uh, grew up I grew up in Oklahoma on a little farm we were as poor as could be. We didn't even have indoor plumbing. And uh, later on, we moved to a bigger city. And uh, my mother was married five times. That's kind of interesting. She was a busy woman. And uh, I've been adopted twice. I got my name Cockrell when I was 16, my husband number four. So I'm already really screwed up. (laughs) And um, then I got to go to college because the doctor had money. She started making better choices, but I didn't go to class. I just had fun and I flunked out and went to, I went in the army. Uh, when I got out of the army, I went to the Washington Hilton in Washington, DC. That's where John Hinckley shot President Reagan back in the eighties coming out of the hotel. And I was a waiter there and um, I got into a management training program and I worked for Hilton for eight years and uh, Washington, Chicago, New York City at the Waldorf, uh, Los Angeles, and I joined Marriott 
hotels, worked for them for 17 years. And since I had focused on food and beverage, I became the vice president of food and beverage operations for Marriott. And then I got recruited by Disney in 1990 to go to France and open Disneyland Paris, which yeah. we did. And then I came back to Orlando in, oh, let's see, 90, 93, and I stayed there 13 years, and I was in charge of all the operations there. So I don't know how it happened. I think I had them fooled for all those years. <laughs> People thought I knew what I was doing. But then I decided I, nobody knows what they're doing, so I was in good company. <laughs> You absolutely are. What an amazing story. What an incredible story. Yeah. So when you were at Disney, you, I mean, this is, this blows my mind anyway. So you led a team of 40,000 cast members and you were responsible for the operations of 20 resort hotels, four theme parks, two water parks, the shopping and entertainment village and the sports and recreation complex. I mean, it's not like you had enough to juggle on a daily basis. <laughs> yeah, I didn't have any idea what was going on, but I surrounded myself by incredible people. They knew what was going on and that's pretty much how I stay out of trouble. I get experts around me. That's the key, is it? Surround yourself with good people. Absolutely. So what was the biggest day-to-day -day challenge that you had when you were running such a large operation? getting everybody to behave themselves <laughs> and, you know, be professional and not do inappropriate things and come to work on time and just some basic human problems. Uh, people are always the problem. It's never anything else. So. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I hear you. Uh, I think that goes with de depending on what, whatever size your business is, that's always the challenge, isn't it? Yeah. It's the only problem you'll have in your life are people. <laughs> And what about the customer service side? Because you, I mean, you wrote a great book on customer service called The Customer Rules. And in my eyes, and in many people's eyes, Disney's, they are just the best at customer service. You know, they are the pinnacle of customer service in, in so many people's eyes. How do they, like, how do they keep the standards so constantly high? Well, it's pretty simple. And any of your listeners can do the same thing. You know, it's a matter of... Uh, I would say we do three things better than anybody else. Number one, we hire better. We're very careful. We have high expectations for performance and we explain those to anybody that wants to work for the company so that there's no misunderstandings about being professional and doing your job the way we train. Second thing is training. We train you and test you and we enforce the training. And you know, we're very serious about that. Uh, it's like we're putting on a show. It's just like on Broadway. You got to be able to do your job on the stage or you won't be on the stage. So <laughs> we audition you, we train you, uh, we rehearse you. And then uh, we create a culture where I would say most people that work at Disney wake up in the morning and are excited to come to work because of the way we treat them. Out of respecting them they have opportunity to get promoted they have opportunity to get development and learn and move up and get promotions and uh, so I always say hire them right train them right and treat them right and uh, it'll work just fine in any company and that's just uh, one of the things that uh, you know I think the problem is people get bored with the basics they don't realize it's about people and there's no upside to not treating people really well I always tell people if you think there is try it on your wife and then you'll find out. And uh, so uh, no upside. There's only a downside. So we, we're very respectful. We're very professional. We care about people having success. And when they have that environment, they go out and take care of the guest because they want to, not because they have to. And that's the difference, I think. When we want to do something, we just do it no matter what, if the boss is around or not. And when we, people make us do things, we only do it when somebody's watching. And we want it that way all the time. And it's a pretty simple formula. And uh, so that's, that's how we think about it. That, that, I mean, that's so true, isn't it? So you keep your team happy and then they keep your customers happy. I, I mean, it, Disney has a real reputation. And I mean, I've been to Disney on a number of times and I love it. Um, I told a story this morning on LinkedIn about visiting um, Magic Kingdom for the first time when I was a 10 year old girl and walking through the gates and walking down Main Street USA and seeing Cinderella's castle and being just 
so blown away and in complete awe of the of the kind of the spectacle of it but the thing that really makes that disney experience is the people and it's the cast members and so i wondered what the what's the the most elaborate thing that you've ever witnessed or seen in terms of customer service at disney for the, you know cast members really going out of their way to make people feel special yeah, well, I, I saw it so often because it's not an unusual thing that cast members do things that you don't expect. I mean, after 9-11, we had one of our people that works in the hotel, a bellman, give his car to a guest who needed to get back to New York and told him he'd pick it up later. Uh, you know, there were no rental cars left. You couldn't fly out after 9-11. This guy said, hey, take my car. I'll come and get it later. Uh, I mean, I see this all the time. I mean, uh, cast member, you know, you lose your phone charger and they go to Walmart and get one for you. And uh, it's just an amazing thing. And it's not because we train them to do that. We train them to take care of the guests. So we allow them to do whatever they decide is uh, something that would be uh, uh, really appropriate and helpful to every customer. So if a little girl gets her dress wet and uh, or dirty or falls down uh, the cast member can give her a new dress no oh. card um, so the, or you don't like you know they have authority our people have authority to do the right thing yeah you've empowered so, them to make that their own decisions about the level of customer service and, and what they can do to help people sure i mean if you hire the right people you train them and you're very clear with your expectations they'll do a great job if you don't trust your people, then you've probably hired the wrong person or you personally have a, some kind of control problem. <laughs> I always tell people, maybe you need to see a psychiatrist. But uh, other than that, uh, that's what we do. We, we expect people to do their job, not have to have somebody watching over them every minute. They're adults. And your people are your brand. Let me tell you what, at the end of the day, your people are your brand. Yeah, I hear you. It's always the people. The rides they know are going to be good. The attractions, the shows, but the people are so different. And people compare from other places they've been. And the comparison is why we are rated so high. We just are better. So how do you think, um, how do you think that that, um, the, the, with the COVID-19 situation that we're all, we've all been part of, how do you think that that Disney magic is going to be with the kind of safety precautions that Disney will have had to have put in place now that they're starting to open up and people will be allowed to come back? Do you think it's going to change it at all? Well, I think that's going to be in every different guest's point of view. I mean, it's going to be rough. It's going to be tough. And, uh, you know, I'm, I, I do worry about it because, uh, if you're comparing from your visit last year, it's going to be totally different and it's not going to be uh, as uh, individualized as it was before where your kids can get close to the characters and all those things. So it's a worry, no question about it. I think the attitude of the cast members will be great. I think Disney will do a good job of enforcing the safety policies, but yeah, it's an issue right? wearing a mask and uh, July and August in Florida. It, it's so hot here now, it's already a problem. So it's just a matter of how, what kind of attitude the guest has about understanding what's going on. And a lot of guests right now around the world are not being very cooperative. Uh, so uh, I don't know. It, it, I hope it'll be fine. You know, I think it'll be good when you're in the show and it's air conditioned and you're watching it or you're doing your rides or in the evening when it gets cooler. But uh, there's challenges, and uh, we've never been through anything this extreme. And so it's hard to say unless we'll just have to see, and I'm sure there will be adjustments every day to policies, procedures, operating guidelines, rules, regulations as we learn more. And so uh, I'm pretty glad I'm retired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you've swerved that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, timing is everything. Well, yeah, definitely. I guess that that's that's a challenge for Disney as well, isn't it? Because all eyes are on them. So you know, the world of attractions, I, I guess, looks at Disney to see how they do things, and then follows. So there's a lot of people that are watching at the moment to see how they how they operate and what the what the guest experience is like. Yeah, and the other problem is, you know, trying to get halfway productive. So many countries with this blockage about people being able to come. Uh, a lot of people are older, 
that you grandparents used to come yeah. with their kids and their grandkids and they're, they're definitely not going to, if you're in the older age group, you're worried about, you know, uh, getting this. And, uh, so there's going to be multiple complications and, uh, all they can do, as I always say, all they can do is do their best and, you know, just work through it and see where this thing ends up. It's uh, it's really crazy right now around the world, actually, <laughs> you know, it's just, it's just too bad. But, uh, 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 then there are P Disney people who God, they would, uh, fly to the moon to go to Disney. So they may love it. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. No, but that's true. Isn't there? Cause that, you know, Disney fans are really, there are a big contingency of them that are really hardcore Disney fans and they'll go back over and over again. They've been on the rides hundreds and hundreds of times. And, and yeah. I can't see that that's going to deter them so much. Oh no, it's not going to deter a lot of people, but on the other hand, Disney needs a lot of people to pay for all that overhead <laughs> expenses. <laughs> You know, if you got one person or a hundred thousand at night, the fireworks cost the same amount. And, uh, so it's, uh, it's, a keeping it safe, keeping it halfway profitable, keeping the guests happy, keeping the cast members safe and making money. That's like a dilemma. <laughs> <laughs> So, so now you've taken, well, I mean, you say you've retired from Disney, but I mean, you haven't actually retired at all, have you? So you are public speaking, you're an author, you have a brilliant podcast, Creating Disney Magic, which I listen to frequently. What, what else is keeping you busy at the moment, Leah? You, do you advise other um, attractions on, on, you know, operations and customer service? Sure. I advise anybody who'll pay me. <laughs> and... Uh, People call, I tell people, I know things you don't know. And if you oh. pay me, I'll tell them to you. And, uh, but, uh, I just have been working on a new, uh, product coming out in the next couple of weeks called Cockerel Academy. <laughs> It'll start out with eight to 10 courses on leadership management, customer service, uh, uh, videos and audios for students who are trying to get in the workforce now advice for them. Uh, a course on decision making, a course on time management. Those will all be rolling out. We're, it's going to be a subscription. It'll be $249 a year for the access to the library. It'll be updated every month with more stuff, new stuff. And I just did that because I've wanted to do it for a long time, but I always had a good excuse. I didn't have time. And now I don't have an excuse anymore. <laughs> no, that's so, it. You've got all the time now. <laughs> Yeah, and I need to go up to my office and work so my wife doesn't leave me, you know. So uh, <laughs> this is how we figured it out. So with the fact that – so you advise – attractions you advise as you said anyone that pays you I know that you work in other sectors as well but if there was if there was one piece of advice you could give to anyone who operates a, an attraction at the moment what, what do you think that would be? Well, I, you know, the key to leadership in my mind and uh, getting people feeling good about trusting you. Uh, when I, every job I had at Hilton Marriott Disney, I'm out in the operation. Everybody knows me. They know I'm available. They know I will solve their problem. I will deal with their issue and they know I'll tell them the truth and uh, I'll be like their mother. I'll, I might love them and tell them I love them, but I might kick their rear end too if they don't do what they're <laughs> supposed to do because I want them to be successful. And I think that's the problem with most organizations. They're not taking a personal interest in the training and development of people and improving their self-confidence or self, you know, their uh, belief in themselves. Uh, and I really focus on getting the people right. I don't really want to know how to run the ride. I could care less. Uh, I just focus on the people and then I know that they will do the, a great job. So it goes back to this, anybody out there in business, hire them right, train them right. And when you train people right, they, they actually get that feeling that you care about them. You know, there's only two things parents worry about in the world. And if you apply these in business, you'll be successful. Parents worry only about two things, safety and education. That's it. <laughs> there's nothing else. <laughs> so don't get confused make it a safe place. And I mean, emotionally too, not just uh, physically. So a place where you're appreciated, uh, people, your opinion counts, uh, people care about you. you. know, everybody wants to be in a place where they matter. That's all. That's what everybody wants. Your wife, your husband, your kid, everybody wants to matter. And leaders can pay attention to that and make sure people know they matter. And, uh, 
If you do that every day, you'll be amazed. Your productivity will go up 50%. Your turnover will go down. People will be nicer. They'll have less, less anxiety, less depression. I mean, create an environment and a culture where people wake up in the morning and want to come to work, not have to come. Great advice. <laughs> I think we all want that. Yeah. I mean, it's basics. This is the basics in life, you know? But it's do you find hard. this? You Your mother you taught can... you this already. <laughs> she did. It's very true. She's a clever woman, my mom. Um, of course. But that's right, isn't it? You know, a lot of people don't focus on the basics and then, and then that's where they make the mistakes. Exactly. <laughs> that's why all these politicians are getting in trouble. They did not focus on 100% safety. And when people don't feel safe, they don't trust you. When they don't trust you, they won't do what you tell them to do. And uh, if you don't build, you know, trust is the number one thing in the world. None of us, you know who you trust. It's probably very few people. You probably trust your mom, <laughs> maybe your dad, uh, your grandmother. Uh, but think of all the people that have let you down or they don't do what they're supposed to do. Or they, you know, it's unbelievable. And uh, I work hard always to make sure people trust me. And uh, if they trust me, they'll do anything I want them to do and I'll do anything for them. And the next thing you know, we are happily married. <laughs> <laughs> How do you um, how do you build that trust? Like, how did you build that trust when you had so many people that you were managing? I mean, I have a small team. There's there's six of us, and um, you know we all trust each other. But it's a it's a we're all together a lot of the time. So how do you build that trust when there's you know forty thousand yeah. members of of you know cast members that you need to you need to build that with? Well. First, I scheduled a lot of time out in the operations every week, walking, talking to the cast members, uh, checking in. Uh, my calendar put me out in the face to face with people. I published a newsletter every Friday that I encouraging people, telling them what my expectations were, what I needed them to do. Today, I would do a podcast for every employee like this. They would be hearing this every Friday for five or six, seven minutes. Uh, and uh, they knew that my reputation was that anybody who wants to see me can come and see me. And that when I started that, the managers started doing it because they didn't want their people coming to see me. So they started to take care of the problems. And I got a reputation for being somebody that followed through. I, you, I had a confidential voicemail. People could leave me a message about something that needed to be fixed or was being ignored or wasn't safe or their manager was doing something inappropriate. And uh, all of our executives had that. So I had a many, many ways to make sure I knew the truth. And second, that uh, when I learned the truth, that I took care of it and made it right. So over time, even if I've never met with people, they had heard about me. Other employees had told them, other cast members told them, hey, you can trust Lee, he's on top of this. So all of a sudden, your reputation grows because people say good things about you behind your back. <laughs> not, not the kinds of things most people say about their manager. <laughs> and uh, that's, uh, somebody say, you know, you want to be trusted, you got to be trustworthy. That's it. <laughs> you know? you got to do the right thing, even if it's hard. And uh, a lot of people don't want to do the hard thing. They want to do the easy things because, you know, hard things are hard. <laughs> so that's... <laughs> And I tell people, if you can't make hard decisions and you can't have hard conversations with people, don't have children and don't be a leader. Good advice. That's all you that, do. I That's love your that, life. I love, that you, uh, I love that you do a podcast with your team now. I love that you've embraced technology and that would be the way that you'd, that you'd keep in touch with everyone. That's great. Hey, I'm on TikTok every morning. <laughs> even I'm not on TikTok you're way ahead I know of me, and you know why you should be <laughs> you'll understand young people like a thousand times better oh, and it's you know, a little scary it's a little scary it is a bit but scary I give them messages every morning and I'm slowly but getting people writing me and say oh I like that I only do 30 seconds maybe a minute um and uh because I want there are a lot of videos on there about police brutality and all. And I've been recommending to police chiefs and enforcement, start watching TikTok and you'll see the attitude of young people around the world. You need to understand where they're coming from and you don't because 
you're too isolated. And so I'm on all the social sites every day. I love that. Do you know what? I'm going to download TikTok tonight. I'm, I'm going to follow you. You're going to be my first follower, Lee. <laughs> <laughs> Right now, I gave advice yesterday for everybody to vote and get Trump out of office. Whoa, okay. Because the young people don't like this, and they're the ones. There's going to be 4 million people turn 18 before the election to vote. And so I, I can reach them that way. Yeah, that's good. It's good that you're using your platform for good, Lee. <laughs> yeah, I am. And uh, also, I'm promoting my work. And... Uh, so you got to be out there and it changes, you know, you got to really be on top of watching what, where people are getting their information. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if you're on Facebook, like I am, you're getting people that are about to die anyway. So, I mean, <laughs> LinkedIn is great professional. I get, I did a post the other day about something. I've had over 20,000 views on it. Wow. You know, that sells books, that sells speeches, that gets me um, being known who I am and so each one has a different audience and um, you got to stay on top of that because it's changing rapidly yeah you know right now the U.S. government's trying to stop TikTok because that's owned by the Chinese and um, as soon as they do somebody else will open another one I mean so you can't stop it people no, are going to give their opinion can't stop free speech Lee for sure yeah what I'd like to do is ask you, well, actually, I've got two, I've got two more questions to ask you. And one I'm not sure about because um, I spoke to a friend just before I came on here and he wanted me to ask you this. And I don't actually know if you like rides, but he's asked if you could only go to one Disney park in the whole world and ride one ride, what would it be and why? Uh, not so much the rides for me, but I like to go to Epcot around four o'clock in the afternoon after it's starting to get a little cooler. Uh, I like to go to the uh, French Pavilion, the UK Pavilion. My wife loves to go to UK Pavilion and shop. <laughs> um, and French Pavilion for perfume. And then around 5, 5.30, we have a little cocktail. And then we have dinner at one of the pavilions. And then we watch the fireworks and go home. So we're there for like four hours and one then we're five hours. And that's my favorite thing to do. Rides, um, you know, they're okay. I mean, I've been on all of them so many times. A rock and roller coaster I kind of like. It really yeah, that's fast. my favorite one. That's my favorite yeah, one. So I, I love I, that. I think that's incredible. And it goes off at a million miles an hour. So, uh, yeah, that's fun. Uh, I've been on every ride so many times because when my grandkids were growing up, they lived in Orlando, the three of them. And. I used to take them all the time. So oh, that uh, must have been an amazing experience to share that with them. Well, I had to ride the rides they like, not the ones I like. So, uh, <laughs> Did they like a small world though? Because that, that's a bit repetitive, isn't it? I think they might have till they could speak, talk. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I don't think so. Uh, no, not really. They like Buzz Lightyear. Okay. Good yeah. choices. Well, look, Lee, we're coming to the end of the podcast and I, I really want to ask you the last question. And it's, um, is there a book that you recommend that's helped shape your career in any way? Oh, yeah. You know, uh, I was not a big reader when I got out of school. I, I learned, my personally learn best by doing. Mm -hmm. So experience is a big deal to me. And then I, one day I started reading and I found out, wow, I'm learning a lot here. Uh, reading, looking at websites, reading the newspaper every day. But I would say one that struck me was uh, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. Yeah. Because it was very basic. And if you do these things, and it's all focused on people. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I started thinking about that, my own uh, behavior, my own communication, my own uh, reaction to things. And that book helped me a lot. I've had it on my desk for Oh God, I think it came out in 89 and uh, that's 30, 31 years ago. So uh, yeah, that had an impact. And I've, I read now every day. I read a lot. Uh, uh, and so there's so much to learn and to understand. And if you don't read, you're probably not going to get the truth because half the people in the world don't know the truth. 
all they know are rumors or what their parents told them. <laughs> I tell people half the stuff in your brain's not even true. So be careful. Well, I mean, that's a great book recommendation. And um, just remember listeners, if you, we always give away a copy of the book recommendation from our guests. So if you would like to win a copy of this book, then just head over to our Twitter account that skip the queue and retweet this episode announcement with the comment. I want Lee's book. And you will be in a chance of winning it. Lee, thank you so much for being on today. It is, it's been such a pleasure to speak to you. I have been so excited about this all week. And it's just well, been great to hear your, it's been, it's been brilliant to hear about your leadership skills and customer service experience. And so thank you. Okay, I'm going to work on Congress here. You work on Parliament. And we'll try to straighten out the world. Tag team, Lee. We've got it covered between the two of us for sure. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks for listening to Skip the Queue. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a five-star review. It really helps others find us. And remember to follow us on Twitter for your chance to win the books that have been mentioned. Skip the Queue is brought to you by Rubber Cheese, a digital agency that builds remarkable systems and websites for attractions that helps them increase their visitor numbers. You can find show notes and transcriptions from this episode and more over on our website, rubbercheese.com forward slash podcast.